Okay, good evening and welcome to Garden Wisdom Wednesdays with the Master Gardeners of the UC Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara Bucket Brigade. Um, tonight we are going to talk about uh, garden startups and in the spirit of the Growing Community Project, uh, I have been actively starting a new garden at my house to uh, participate in the learning that uh, is going on here and in our uh, on-site uh, gardening and education programs at Trinity Gardens. Um, for those of you who are new to the program, the Growing Community Project is a modern twist on victory gardening and crowdsourcing. So the goal is to get as many members of the community as possible growing uh, vegetable gardens at home uh, or in community gardens. Uh, and the goal is to then harvest uh, the produce that we grow and share that with people who are on food aid um, and need food support in Santa Barbara County through groups like the Food Bank, Catholic Charities, Food from the Heart and others. Um, uh, we've been crowdsourcing now for about a year uh, at the Bucket Brigade. We've developed some systems. We're feeling very good about it and excited to share that with the community. But most importantly, um, this process is about building community and it's about learning and growing together, not just in terms of vegetables, but in terms of friendships, relationships, and our knowledge um, in, uh, about growing plants and, and vegetables and gardens. So um, I'm so pleased to uh, share my startup here and I'll show a couple of pictures of, of kind of where I'm at. And those of you who may be experts or beginners may sympathize with me, but uh, I needed to get my kids um, out of the house, uh, away from their computers and out into the garden. And this pro project seemed like a really likely way to do it. And so, um, oh, let's see, here we go. So here is my farm site. So after last week's lessons with the master gardeners, we learned that the important thing was to pick a site that had plenty of sun uh, not too many root problems, and um, hopefully had some good native soil. And in my case, I didn't have uh, good soil on the ground uh, or very much yard space, but I did find a small area that uh, got enough sun and that wasn't under an oak tree, and there it is. And so my son and I got to work with our recycled lumber, and we made a bed. We lined it with um, uh, gopher wire and we raised it up a little higher, leveled it. Uh, that was a lot of digging uh, to level it in, but that got a nice level bed. You can see I've got my level there and my dog Hazel supervising. And uh, then we made another bed site and my son dug it out, um, which was good exercise and good time off the computer. And uh, there it is. Um, so we are ready for this garden education personally and collectively. Uh, to learn what to do once we've got to this point. And with that, I want to introduce uh, our first master gardener that will speak this evening. Uh, her name is Selena. And Selena, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and let's get this started. Hello, uh, yes, I'm Selena Andrade and I've been a master gardener for about a year and a half. So I'm a newbie master gardener, but I have been gardening for many years. And I, I, do, I do have raised beds, I have two raised beds uh, that I've had for about a dozen years. Uh, they are um, 12 by four and now are now 18 inches tall. They started out 12, but I recently raised them. And tonight I wanna talk about uh, some pros and cons about, uh, about raised beds. And it won't be specifically about building them or the soil that will all come later today, uh, but the benefits and some, maybe some disadvantages. So, and I'll be reading a lot of <laughs> this. One of the reasons to use raised planting veggies in free of soil raised higher than ground level. Like every other garden system, the raised bed system has many benefits and some possible disadvantages. You want to understand both sides of the debate before you make any decisions. First, the benefits. Number one, and I have this up here for the soil. A raised bed is really a way of setting up your soil for the earliest possible gardening. 
Instead of tilling up the soil from year to year to add fertilizer and amendments, gardeners usually maintain their raised beds by simply adding materials on top. Compost, mulches, manures, and other soil conditioners can all go directly onto the top few inches of the soil without the need for backbreaking work. And we'll be discussing soil, uh, compost, mulch, et cetera, uh, both today and some, uh, later in the series. Number two, your back will thank you. A raised garden means less bending and stooping, so gardening is much easier on the body. It's surprising how much back and knee strength can happen just by weeding a garden, especially a large one, and this can take a serious toll over time. A raised garden in the garden, especially improving access for those in wheelchairs. Raised beds, especially ones that are at least 12 inches tall, can reduce debilitating back and joint pain. And in order to have um, access from both sides, the, the width of a raised bed should be no more than about four feet. And if you only have access from one side, make the bed no wider than three feet. These containers give you the option to build even higher levels, which reduces the back, neck, and shoulder strain, commonly resulting from typical non-container garden practices. And then, as I mentioned, this past year, I raised the height of my raised bed from 12 inches to 18 inches, and that made a great difference in my own well-being and my gardening. Number four, weed, re I mean, I'm sorry, number three, weed reduction. By keeping your garden's earthy contents separate from the wild surroundings outside the uh, comfortable container, there's less chance for weed seeds to spread through your growing environment, thus reducing weed growth. Since you're bringing in your own soil mix to start as well, this doubles your protection against weed invasion, especially if you ensure that your mix is weed free. Not using native soil from the ground will also ensure weed reduction. And in addition, if your kit or construction comes with um, bottom protection that shields against the earth underneath it, it becomes all the harder for plants and weeds growing outside of the container to find their way in. Number uh, four, let faster root growth. Low set containers, which hold a finer textured growing mix, allow for quicker root development than if plants were planted in backyard sod or hard pan alone. Such soils are tougher on root development and impact plant appearance, health, and harvest times. Not so if you introduce your own mix and particularly one that's better designed for nurturing sensitive plant growth. Better root growth equals healthier plants, which ultimately equals higher yields. A caveat, I learned the hard, a hard lesson this year by failing to add enough compost to bagged soil labeled, quote, raised uh, bed mix, red, raised, I'm sorry, raised bed potting soil. And I, and, and I failed to mix it in. This led to poor drainage and the need to try to amend the plants uh, uh, while they were growing. Number five, less soil compaction. Soil in containers never gets compacted by being walked on, making it excellent for both plant and um, soil health. Number six, higher yields. For gardeners intent on growing their own food, the appeal of increasing vegetables and produce yields through intensive planting is a real plus. Raised beds are the perfect setups for much closer clustered planting. Instead of having a traditional garden where much of the space is dedicated to paths or spaces for conventional row planting, you use up all your space in a much smaller container garden and can thus grow a whole lot more in only a fraction of the space. Number seven, less runoff, better drainage. Since soil has nowhere to go when held within a planter, unless it has no bottom, in which case soil uh, runoff does leach downward, you won't lose nutrients or structure after hard rains like you would in a typical garden. Uh, if you are dedicated to improving your soil microbial health and encouraging the liveliest, healthiest, and most diverse growing environment possible, containers will further ensure that the microbes you've lovingly tended for so long don't go anywhere else. Uh, the most popular depth for a raised bed is 11 inches, which is one inch below the sides of a 12 inch uh, garden bed box. For most crops, this is enough drainage and gives plants almost a foot of extra breeding room above wet conditions. Raised beds also tend to drain better in general, even in heavy rains. Number eight, fewer or no chemicals. A sharing good soil and amendments will enable the use of fewer or no chemicals, and that just speaks for itself. Number nine, you can plan raised beds earlier in the season. Largely attributed to better drainage in the soil, early planting in raised beds is possible 
because the soil dries out, uh, dries out faster in the spring and warms more quickly for planting than soil at ground level. Many gardeners also find a surprising number of plants have overwintered in a raised bed, which likely wouldn't have been able to at ground level. Again, much of this has to do with the type of soil in the bed. If untilled and fortified with compost, your soil will um, regulate temperatures better than disturbed nutrient poor soil. Number 10, raised beds help keep out critters. And this is really an important one. Slugs can climb, but the tall sides of a raised garden deck slow them down and provide an opportunity to stop them in their tracks. You can also install hardware cloth on the bottom of the box to stop burrowing critters like gophers from stealing root crops. Now, when I first put my raised beds in, uh, I think it was about 10 or 12 years ago, I did use um, chicken wire. And this last couple of years, I did find that gophers and moles had found their way in. They, they chewed right through it, but that was a few years later. And I'm now in the process of emptying the beds and laying hardware cloth before I start my winter garden. So that's my big project in these next couple of weeks. If deer are a problem, you can add deer fencing directly to your bed or purchase a box with a built-in deer fence. It's also much easier to add plastic uh, hoops to raised garden beds for bird barriers, hold frames, or roll covers. And the last one is raised beds are great for beginners. Raised beds provide an easy way to start gardening by removing many barriers for beginners. They take a little bit more investment up front, but in many ways guarantee success in the first year. Now I've got three disadvantages that I wanna talk about. Number one is the extra cost. One of the downsides of raised beds is the extra cost. If money is an issue, raised bed gardening might not shine so bright, unless you've got someone like, like the bucket brigade donating your beds. <laughs> Building raised beds may not break the bank, but it will surely cost more than shoveling out a garden patch in the earth. Even if you construct the raised beds yourself, you'll have to buy all the necessary building materials and tools. If you pay a handyman to help out, you may be investing more than you will save on store-bought groceries in, over several years of time. It is, however, important to note that raised beds can also be constructed with materials that you may already have laying around, like cinder blocks, river rocks, bricks, aluminum siding. The idea being that soil is built up and contained within a structure that allows for the same advantages of typical raised beds. Number two, the need to purchase soil. Another of the costs of raised bed gardening is the need to purchase soil and other amendments. Like containers, raised beds need to be filled with good soil and bagged soil isn't cheap. Other noteworthy raised bed problems have to do with the quality of, of bagged soil. Uh, remember um, my example of the raised bed mix that wouldn't drain properly. Uh, Store-bought soil may not have the nutrients and mineral contents of natural soil. Don't forget that soil in raised beds and, uh, will heat up more than in ground soil and then in in-ground soil and the hot soil isn't necessarily a boon to growing plants. And finally, water use. Everyone realizes the importance of conserving water these days. Raised bed gardening like container gardening requires more water more frequently than in-ground gardens. In hot summers, water evaporates more quickly and raises any type of automatic irrigation like a water efficient drip system uh, will be harder and more expensive to install in raised bed gardens. So you may end up watering by hands all summer, which is what I do because I do not have a drip system. Um, it is important to remember, however, that having the proper mix of soil, compost amendments and mulch will assure that the moisture is held longer and more efficiently. So, do raised bed advantages outweigh the disadvantages? Who can argue with, with growing twice as much food in a controlled environment that can be utilized almost anywhere at a comfortable height? This seems a no brainer, but it also seems that neither raised bed gardening nor in-ground gardening are intrinsic, intrinsically better, than for, uh, better for growing crops. After weighing the pros and cons, the decision is an individual one and you'll have to make it with your own lifestyle and backyard in mind. Either choice can set you up, set you up with a lush and productive garden. Thank you. <laughs> and I have a few resources listed here. Thank you, Celine. That was very succinct and well done. Um, Thank you. So now we've heard from the master gardeners about 
the differences, pros and cons of uh, raised bed and, and in-ground gardening, um, which is helpful uh, uh, as you're thinking about starting garden or, or expanding your garden. And next up, uh, we wanna talk a little bit about soil treatment um, and, and soil amendment and ways to approach soil to um, have a uh, healthy and productive garden. And to do that, we have Trudy with us. Um, Trudy, you got your microphone heated up? That's very good. Um, and uh, we will hand it over to you. Take it away. Awesome, thank you. So my name is Trudy Adair Verbeas and I became a master gardener in 2019. But like Selena, I'm a lifelong gardener starting with being born and raised on an organic farm in Northern Utah. So I hopefully have lots of good information to share with you today, all of which came from UCANR, the University of Southern California uh, Natural Resources. Um, I'm going to be talking about soil and then soil preparation for raised beds and finally, soil preparation for in-ground gardening. So to start with, just a, a few thoughts about soil in general. So soil is your foundation for success for your vegetable crops. And soil basically has four parts. It has the mineral part, which is comprised of combinations of sand, loam, and clay air, water, and organic matter. That's what soil is made of. But great soil is rich in organic matter and has lots of spaces that hold water and air and allows that air and water to move freely, which then roots can pick up and carry those nutrients, the oxygen and water directly to the plants. Great soil also has the 17 primary, secondary, and micronutrients that are important for plant development. And all soil benefits from the addition of organic matter. And even a 1% increase in organic matter can make a huge difference in your soil's health. So the goal is to create a soil environment where plants thrive and produce. So we get all those yummy vegetables that we want to grow. The soil is what actually feeds and waters those vegetables. And when you think about those vegetables growing, they're reaching down into the soil with their roots, which for most vegetables, penetrate the soil surface between two and 12 inches, which is where a lot of the nutrients that are available in soil lies and is then able to be taken up in those roots to feed the plants and to water the plants. There are some vegetables that have much deeper root systems. Tomatoes, for example, can have roots that penetrate the soil surface as much as two to three feet. Some beets also have extensive root systems. So it's something to think about when we're talking about both raised beds and in-ground planting, the soil depth at which some of our root vegetables and above ground vegetables do penetrate the soil. Fertile, biologically active soil readily captures water and nutrients, has a good structure and texture, and helps plants to fight disease. For raised beds, those of you who are going to be growing in raised beds are going to be receiving your soil from AgriTurf, which has a planting mix that's high in porosity, which means it allows that air and water to flow within the soil mix. It is also water holding because it contains pumice, which absorbs and holds water. That soil from AgriTurf is not, not certified organic, but it is composed of organic materials. 
And those of you with raised beds in the six to three foot range or the eight to four foot range by one foot deep will need approximately 1.2 yards of soil. Or in other words, somewhere between 10 and 14 bags of soil should fill your raised bed. A good thing to remember, and you saw it in Abe's pictures that he shared a few minutes ago of their preparation for the raised beds, they started with the ground underneath the raised bed. So they loosened all of that ground and leveled it before placement of the raised beds on top. When you do that, you also are preparing the ground in a way that the roots that are in your raised beds can penetrate through the gopher wire down into the soil in your yard. So break up the soil prior to starting your raised bed will be a huge advantage for those deep rooted vegetables. When you have your raised bed ready to go, start by layering your soil about a third at a time. Don't dump it all in at once, fill the bed completely because as you're adding soil to a raised bed, air pockets are created. So if you layer your soil in roughly a third at a time, you can gently pat the soil down or like I do, I poke my fingers into the soil to remove the air pockets. And you can continue layering a third, a third and a third. And you don't want to fill your bed to the very top because we're going to add some organic material to that bed. Um, and so leaving a space, I hope you can see my fingers, of three inches, even four inches below the surface of the rail of your raised bed will allow you to then add some organic matter, materials, compost, that then you can work into the soil. And you want to work that organic material in about eight inches deep. Once you have your organic material added, then you can water in all of your raised bed. As you do that, you'll watch the soil start to settle a bit, which then allows you to either add a little bit more soil, a little bit more compost, still keeping your top of your bed about two inches below the surface of your rails around the sides of your raised bed. That way, when you water or you put in a drip system that Janet's going to be talking about, or you're using your hose or a watering can, you won't be washing out the soil over the sides of your bed. Finally, once your soil is in and it's had a chance to settle, then you're ready to plant. And Janet is going to follow up my presentation with planting plans. Remember, you want to follow the directions on your seed packets for the distance between seeds and plants. Also on your, your seed starts, there's usually a tag. And if you read the back of the tag, it will tell you how far to plant your plants apart from one another. Once your plants are in, then it's always a good idea to mulch. Mm -hmm. Mulch can be straw, compost, newspaper, cardboard. Mulching helps keep water in your soil from evaporation. That mulch will benefit your plants hugely. It will cut down on your water use. 
one critical thing to remember when you're mulching is to leave a space around the stems of your plants. Just a small space that allows the mulch to not come in contact with the root and potentially damage the, the So Keith or Abe, it looks like um, Trudy's having a little difficulty with her Wi-Fi. Do we want to maybe move on and then when she gets things straightened out, she can kind of come in with her conclusion? Okay, Abe, I'm kind of waiting for a word from you. You're muted right now. I wonder if you could unmute and kind of give us the thumbs up to move on. All right, well, I'm just gonna take over then. Hi, I'm Janet Rogers, and um, I'm uh, also a master gardener here in Santa Barbara County and a lifeline gardener. And uh, I'm gonna, I saw that Trudy just made it back in. Trudy, are you able to finish up right now? Trudy, you're muted, honey. Trudy, you're muted. <laughs> Not hearing you. Trudy, can you finish up? Can you unmute yourself and finish up? Okay. She's frozen again. Yeah, I'm just going to, you know, hopefully everything else is working and I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking today about planning your garden, planting your plants now that you have your raised bed and you have it filled with soil. So one of the first things that's really good to consider is how are you going to get plant water to your plants? And are you gonna do it by hand with a hose or are you gonna use some kind of a drip system? If you're doing it by hand, you're set to go. If you want to put in a drip system, you can put it in at any time, but it's easiest to put it in before you plant. Oh, let me just back this up a second. So a couple of ways that you can um, drip water to your plants, and it's one of the most efficient ways because it gets water right to the base of your plants where it needs to be. So over here on the left hand side, it shows a soaker hose and this is one of the easiest ones. You hook it up to your hose, you run your soaker bed through your, um, through your beds and you're basically all set. You can determine kind of the pressure by just putting more or less water through your hose. So you want just enough for it to drip and not spray. Another way shown here in the middle, and these are half inch um, drip tubes where you put emitters and you can see from the picture where the emitters are because the water has come out in those areas. So this obviously works really well for individual plants and perhaps a little less well for when you have group plantings of smaller plants. And over here on the right, I just, it was hard to get a picture of, this is quarter inch tubing. Generally across the top, you would have a half inch header. Kind of that's, that's what you're seeing here, here is half inch, a half inch header across the top. And then you run these quarter inch tubings have 
preset reinforced holes every six inches and that way they drip every six inches and you can also put them pretty close together. So here in a forfeit bed, for example, they put four half inch lines, but with the smaller tubing, you can put them quite a bit closer together. So those are a couple of ways to do that. And I'm just gonna talk really briefly because um, this is not really about um, installing water systems. But if you do choose to install a system and you don't want to just directly hook a hose up to it every time that you want to water, then here is what you'll need. So some kind of timer on it. And I want you to just note before, as I start here that there's no specific brand that we recommended. There are many, many choices available. I just got whatever pictures I could to give you an idea of the types of timers that there are. So this kind of timer is a really easy one because it's like your kitchen timer. And you basically, you have one side on your uh, hose bib and the other side with your, um, either a hose to connect to your drip lines or you can, directly put your drip lines on here and then you just turn that to the desired amount of time and it turns off at the end. It means you do have to go out each time that you want it. You want to um, have your plants watered but it makes it so you never leave uh, your drip on and walk away and forget it for a couple of hours. There are several different types of timers that you can set the start time and the length of time that you want it on and the frequency, whether you want it every other day or every third day. And um, I just put both of these up here because this is a, for one zone, like you have one um, drip line that comes off of this one and you have this would be for two different zones. You can have two different drip lines. They make three. So, and they make four. <laughs> so just to give you an idea, in addition to that, Along your line, you need a backflow valve so that the water doesn't back up, you know, back into the, your house line. A pressure regulator of 25 or 30 PSI, pounds per square inch, so that you don't blow out the emitters in your hose. The PSI coming out of your house is somewhere between 50 and 60. And so you need to cut that basically in half and you need a filter so that you don't clog things up. Um, these are, you can find these parts at any hardware store. Um, they often have, even in the hardware stores, they'll have um, little booklets about kind of how to put a system together. And if you need any help, the irrigation stores are really happy to help you with all of your questions. And if you say, you know, I want to put this hose bib timer on and I, you know, I know there's some stuff I need on here um, and I don't know what it is and they'll just help you with it. So that's as much as I'm gonna say about drip systems because I really wanted to talk much more about um, kind of designing how you're gonna plant your plants in this one. So this one, one of the first things that um, I'm gonna just kind of jump to the second one, <laughs> which, which is, there are eight plants that um, the food bank has requested that the Bucket Brigade grow. These are the crops that they need. And so just depending on what kind of space you have, how big your beds are, how many beds you have, do you want to try to grow all eight of them? Do you want to grow one, like a whole bed of one crop or two or three? So that's kind of the one of the first things that um, you need to talk about or think about on that one. The next one is, you're, are you going to kind of plant them in rows? And, you know, here's a nice, you know, they put a little row here and then a little row. Are you going to plant them in rows? Or for those um, plants that you're going to grow from seeds, are you going to scatter plant them? And um, so there are a lot of different uh, kind of options on here. None, none of them are right or wrong, but just kind of how do you want to lay your beds out? One of the things though, that's a really good idea, and John touched on that last time if you were with us last week, and that is that your taller plants 
should go at the back or the north side of your bed so they don't shade the rest of your bed. And then the smaller plants will be in the front. And you can kind of see that over here on the right as well. They put kind of taller plants in the back and smaller ones in the front. And this is a good example, or at least it's good example as I could find visually to kind of show you maybe a scatter planting where it's not in these nice neat little rows, but it's all growing just fine. It helps to know your vegetables. And so I put together a little chart here and um, this just shows the spacing in the rows, the space between rows, the days to maturity and the particular Santa Barbara bucket brigade varieties that have been chosen, their days to, ma to maturity. And um, it's if you kind of take a look at that column, it really shows that the varieties that were picked were the um, fast maturing var uh, varieties, they're on the low end of the days to maturity. And then just a couple of, of little notes about things. And um, we'll talk to a little bit about intensive planting. And I think that Selena touched on that in the beginning where we're in a raised bed, you can kind of crowd things a little bit more. And so in intensive plant planting, when you look at the column on the space in a row, you're really looking at the lower end of that, um, of those numbers. Okay, so <clears throat> in, um, in a small raised bed, intensive planting is common. It's the idea of getting the most productivity out of your garden space. And I'll mention the first, one of the first concepts of intensive planting, which is vertical planting, even though for this fall, none of the, um, none of the plants that we're being asked to plant uh, would be grown vertically. But keep this in mind if for in the spring that a way to get more plants or more productivity out of your small space is to grow things vertically. The next one is compact planting. And again, we just kind of talked about that in the spacing between them. In garden spaces where you need, um, you need walking spaces in between. And, uh, you know, a lot of times you will put larger spaces between things. And here you tend to crowd things a little bit. And that's one of the reasons that soil is so important and that um, Trudy touched on that, how important it is to have really good soil and really good amendments put in the soil because intensive planting is really intense on your soil as well. Interplanting is another one, which is kind of the concept of planting slower maturing varieties or slower maturing plants with later maturing plants so that you can plant um, things in between each other or very close to each other where the early maturing plant will be taken out, will be harvested and then leave room for those long maturing ones to continue. So that's an interplanting. And then successive planting is uh, when a crop is har harvested, basically you plant them again. Um, so if a uh, so if you finish up a, a, a section of a particular plant, you can just plant again. But also if, for example, you you have broccoli and when your broccoli comes up and starts to head and you cut that, you're gonna be cutting that head and then there will be side shoots that come and you'll be cutting side shoots. As it starts to head, you can plant new young broccoli in between so that two weeks or three weeks or four weeks later, when that older plant is finished producing and you take it out, you already have starts that are really kind of almost coming up underneath. So those are a couple of ways of doing um, interplanting and, su and successive planting, sorry. Um, so again, a couple of, of views of that. We've got a couple of um, over here on the bottom left, some ways of vertically um, growing things. We have some close together 
And also this is almost monoculture. So it looks like all varieties of lettuce. So again, those decisions on whether you're gonna grow lots of different varieties or all of one, you know, one kind. Um, here they're growing uh, some kind of lettuce between it looks like peppers. So this is an interplanting, um, you know, just different. here's the cucumbers kind of growing up. And back here, they've got lettuce growing between onions. And that's just fine because the lettuce will be harvested, the onions will stay, and also lettuce roots, um, it would be a little different, like you probably wouldn't want to put a, a, another root crop between onions because they're both root crops and they're taking up space in the soil, whereas the roots of spinach are not bulbous and large, and so they don't really crowd onions that much. Okay. Um, so another, this is an interesting gardening concept and I'm just throwing it out there for all you mathematically uh, inclined people. Um, it's a form of intensive planting where you have, um, where you have a grid laid out in one foot squares. And there's lots of different ways, as you can see from the pictures of kind of creating those one foot squares. Um, one of the ones I really liked, this came as close as I could find. This looks really like a kind of a um, sweating drip, like a drip system that's like a soaker hose, which is interesting. I'm not really familiar with that, but what I've seen is that they use, they put the, um, from the header tubing, they'll put, you know, four, if it's a four foot bed, they'll have four of them that divide it. And then they just have the string like here, they have the strings across. And then you have this uh, for watering and your strings across for dividing it. So there are some advantages uh, to it that are listed here. And an interesting thing is, and this is the kind of mathematical or engineering sort of mind, Plants are planted generally in within a square, either one to a square, four, nine, or 16 to a square. And so over here, it kind of shows that. And so you would look on this chart here, for example, for beets. Beets are nine to a square. So you're planting it. You can see, I'm going to have to move this out of the way, but you can see it. So this is a nine, like within a one square foot square garden, this is how beets would be planted. And carrots are 16, so it would be planted this way. And broccoli is, oops, sorry. That was, um, hmm, not letting me go back. Um, but broccoli is one, and so it would be just planted in the middle. And I just threw that out there because I think it's a really interesting way, just one more idea on a way to plant. And then, um, I keep clicking it and then it goes forward. There we go, we got it back. Uh, pictures are worth a thousand words. So here are just some different raised beds um, that give you some ideas of um, different ways of organizing your plants. Some very organized, some very, um, you know, a little wilder, some really close together, some with spaces in between them. So a couple of parting thoughts here. Uh, lots to know about gardening, but you don't have to know much. You can just start. You will learn a lot as you go along and gardens teach you a lot. And as I've said about a lot of things um, in the past couple of minutes, there really is no right or wrong way or right or wrong decision about each of these. You try something that makes sense, and you go from there and adjust from there. Um, basically, if you put plants in the ground and water them, they will grow. And gardens do not look good all the time. There'll be a time when things are sort of past their peak or um, you know, they're, everything's just starting and there's a lot of ground that you see, but don't expect per perfection all the time or for, as I say, for it to just look beautiful all the time, but it will be beautiful. Um, in different ways at all times. You'll be planting and harvesting plants at different times. Just keep planting. And if something doesn't work the first time, 
go with the old adage, just try it again and definitely be sure that you have fun. And I've listed some of the um, resources that I used and really good resources for uh, anyone looking into raised bed planting, um, intensive planting, um, square garden, you know, square foot planting, and just some charts on spacing of plants and, and everything. So thank you. That I hope that's uh, been informative. And I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back over to, to Abe, who is muted at this point. Okay, so here's, uh, I'm just looking at my chat. Um, I guess the power went out for on Keith, so he really can't be there. And um, Abe's really not answering our queries here. So I think um, perhaps what we could do is um, look, I'm gonna encourage people if you have questions to Type your questions into the Q&A. If you're not familiar with Zoom, the Q&A is at the bottom of your screen. And if you don't see a menu bar across the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, if you run your mouse over the bottom, it should pop up for you. And so the first question that came up was, and I'll read this. I've read that you shouldn't make raised garden beds out of old railroad ties because the creosote used to preserve them can leach into your garden soil. Are there other materials to avoid for building beds? So I, I could kind of speak to that. Um, definitely railroad ties are not good and any other wood that's been treated. I've been, I had hoped that, um, I know Keith is a builder and I had hoped that he would be here so I could ask the question, is pressure treated uh, lumber um, treated, I mean pressure treated it, does that have a chemical treatment in it that would um, make it so that you wouldn't want to build your beds out of it? I'm going to hazard a guess that it is, but if you, um, that's a question that we can ask, eight, no, we can ask uh, Keith when he gets back on. Um, the only other thing, I had had a question when I saw some raised beds, they were made out of it looked like the corrugated uh, metal that's used in sort of shed roofing. And um, it looked very, I mean, it was seemed very nice because they, they could just build a framework and then attach that on there. It seemed like an easy way to do. And my question to them was, does it get hot? Do the beds get hotter because they're metal? Hmm. And they said that they, um, they had not really um, noticed that there was any problem with that. Jana, but I would, great. but I would, yeah, I'll be right with you. But they, but if it were me, I'd probably paint it white so that it would be reflective. Trudy, hi. I apologize to everybody. Apparently, the power went out in my neighborhood, <laughs> so I. Yeah. Power. Well, this has been going on. I'm I'm very very sorry. Um, I don't know if you want to pick up with the rest of in ground um, planting or if we're too far beyond that. Um, in ground planting meaning, give me an idea what you mean. So for the soil prep for in ground. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, let me just check and see. Um, I, I'm going to just check in questions and see if there's a, there's one more question um, that perhaps Trudy, you could answer since it's about mulch. And that was what kinds of mulch do you recommend? So mulch can be any of those things I talked about earlier. You can use straw very effectively as a mulch. You can use compost as a mulch. News even cardboard that shredded works as a mulch. And I've actually at various times used all three of those 
or four of those items in my own garden. So any of those would work. They're inexpensive and readily available. Um, I, I will just add that I use, um, now this is not in a raised bed, but in an in-ground garden. And I use, um, you know, a kind of like a chipped wood, which you don't want to use too much of because it, um, it takes post nitrogen from your soil to break down, but it is great to use in the areas between your plants, like in the rows where you're going to be walking. So that's another thing that you can um, use. I also got an, an answer from Keith. He maybe can't get on in this way, but he's um, obviously monitoring and coming along. And he said, thank you, Keith. I knew you would know this one. He said, we do not recommend pressure treated lumber to be used for building raised beds. It has the same problems as railroad ties, bad chemicals. So um, I sort of knew that, but I did, I'm really happy to have gotten a builder to back that one up for me. And Janet, if I could add one comment to other alternatives for raised beds, I very successfully used horse troughs the metal horse troughs for drinking water at um, some of the school gardens that we put in place. And those metal horse troughs made wonderful raised beds for us. We did include drainage holes in the bottom of those troughs and around the bottom edge so that they um, drained, but they were a great raised bed alternative. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience. Okay. Um, I have one more question here. And then if more questions come in, we'll continue with that. Otherwise, we'll pop back to Trudy and she'll talk about in ground uh, planting and soils. So the next question we have is I'm worried about gophers. Selena said they chewed through her chicken wire. Is there something else to use? So, Selena, that question's for you. Oh, it okay. looks like well, Selena. Now, yeah. As I said, it, it did. It was a few years. It was a few years before uh, they chewed through it, but they did eventually. Like I said, I have had my beds about a dozen years, and uh, they, they both chewed uh, through them, and they also raised, like just pushed them up. It was it's it's a it's a softer wire, I guess, and they pushed it up. So as I was be digging and trying to uh, or plant, I would come up against pumps uh, where they had pushed up the the, the um mm -hmm. the wire the go for the chicken wire so what i'm using now is a hardware cloth uh it it's it's strong it it's got i think the one i'm using has half inch or a half inch uh squares in them and uh they're it's four feet wide so it's perfect you know for a four, four foot uh wide bed and uh, I just bought uh, 25 feet of it, so it's going to be perfect for my two beds. And uh, when I, I just built another new bed um, recently and laid that in there, so I'm, I'm hoping I won't have uh, the same problem with gophers because I do have a big gopher problem. But I, I would go with hardware cloth or something yeah. definitely stronger than chicken wire. Well, chicken wire, I think its ground life is from two to four years, and mm -hmm. hardware cloth has um, has lasted, you know, eight to 10 plus years. Yes. Um, there is a cost differential, but yeah. um, it's, uh, it's a much stronger and longer lasting material. Okay. Um, so no more questions at this time, but if anyone, you know, if another question pops in your head, if you put it in, in q and I'll just interrupt Trudy. I do that with Great regularity anyway. And, um, but I think she now could finish. Um, she was great. She talked about soils in raised beds and wanted to kind of touch on in ground soil. So Trudy, go ahead. Thank you, Janet. And again, I apologize for my absence. Who knew the power was going to go out in my neighborhood? So for in-ground planting, probably one of the most important things is to only work your soil 
when it's low, low moisture or dry. And of course, now a helicopter is going right over my house. Wow, it's the night for interruptions. <laughs> well, we can hear you. We don't hear the helicopter. So if you can just talk over it, Trudy, we'll be okay. So if you work the soil when it's dry, that avoids compacting the soil and creating um, clumps and spaces in the soil where the air and moisture really can't penetrate. You want to try to till the soil to a depth of 12 to 18 inches. You also want to know what your soil type is. And soil, as I mentioned in my beginning remarks, is either sandy, loam, or clay, or a combination of those things. And there's a really amazing, easy soil test that you can do. It's called the ribbon test. You put a small amount of damp soil in your hand and you squeeze. If it falls apart when you let go, you have mostly sandy soil. If it stays together when you let go, you have loam soil, which is ideal, the best soil. But if when you squeeze, a strip of soil oozes out between your fingers, you most likely have clay soil. And as I mentioned um, in my first remarks, all soil, all three of those soil types benefit from the addition of organic matter. So once you know your soil type, you then can make some good choices about the kinds of amendments that you want to add. And we will be discussing specific amendments in our next presentation. Another consideration for in-ground planting is your soil's pH. In Southern California, most of our soil is in a pH range of 5.5 to 7.5, which happens to be a great range for vegetable planting. It's not imperative that you test your soil pH. If you have a particular concern about it, there are soil test kits that you can purchase. But for the most part, our soils in Southern California fall in that nice range between acidity and alkaline. And vegetables love a soil pH of 6.5. That's ideal for them. But anything between 5.5 and 7.5 works just perfect. When you prepare your soil, you're digging to a depth of 12 to 18 inches. You add compost two to four inches and work it into a depth of eight inches. And any other amendments that you choose to add, you want to make sure you've worked into the soil. Once you've done all that, you water to settle the soil. And, and if you can, you let that area that you've prepared for planting rest a couple of weeks. By letting it rest for those two weeks, it allows that compost and the amendments that you may have added to begin to break down and enrich the soil. At that point, you're ready to plant. And Janet has shared a wonderful design for planting. So you'll be prepared to put your plants in in the most optimal manner. Once your plants are in, again, Adding mulch is a critical step. Um, the addition of between two and four inches of the mulch that we just talked about can reduce water evaporation from your soil by as much as 70%, which is huge, especially in Southern California where we all want to be and need to be water conscious. Mulch making that 70% potential difference is huge. So I highly recommend it. 
you will want to consider fertilizers and amendments throughout the growing season. And we're going to be talking specifically about some fertilizers and amendments that you may want to apply to your vegetable crop. And one thing to think about when we get to the point that we're harvesting those wonderful vegetables, we wanna cut them off at the soil surface and leave the roots in the ground. And the reason for doing that is you're adding that root and the decomposition of that root to your soil health and your soil fertility. So we'll talk about harvest in a few more weeks, but just something to keep in mind in case things develop quickly and you decide you want to do some harvesting. Thank you, Janet. Okay, and thanks Trudy. And I'm gonna bring Keith back into the loop. Um, Keith, Trudy also had a difficulty like you did. And so about three quarters of the way through her talk, um, she cut out. And so I have already talked and then we've gone back and uh, we actually answered the questions that came into the Q&A. And, um, and then Trudy was just able to finish up. And so I think we've answered all the questions that have come in and uh, we've um, finished up what we had to talk about today. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you to maybe for closing remarks and it's uh, 6.30, so we're just about there. Well, thanks for taking over there. Yeah, the power went out here for about 10 minutes or so. Yeah. And I joined as an attendee, and then I finally figured out how to come back in as a panelist. Um, everything sounded great, a lot of good information. Um, thanks to uh, Selena and Trudy and Janet for um, all the education on gardening. Um, there is a lot more information at sbbucketbrigade.org. There is a uh, growing community link that has the uh, Master Gardener's Handbook and a great composting booklet uh, from the county. Um, so everybody just keep going with it. And um, we're gonna be installing garden beds maybe as early as next week. And we're getting more and more requests coming in. So everything's going smooth so far. And I wanna thank uh, all of you again and the Master Gardeners for uh, co-hosting this uh, webinar. And we will see you all next week. Okay, thanks Keith. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. thank you. Thank you.